like this shit is money. Trust me. Take this shit it's currency and turn it into money, right? Was, yeah, definitely. Same kind of exact situation. So the mob tells Pee Wee, look, man, we're not giving you cash, but this work we got is A1. You're a smart kid. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. take this product back, you'll figure it out. Okay. He takes the $300,000 worth of jab back to Harlem. Street legend has it, he turned that into 900000 Now, again, that's 900000 late 60s money. And he's like 16 years old. That's like $9 million today's money, right? That would lead to him becoming what he, his nickname was, the Bank of Harlem. That the countless numbers, not in the hundreds, but in the thousands of rents he paid, mm -hmm. tuitions he paid, mm -hmm. um, businesses in Harlem that he would go on to fund. Because Pee Wee's thing was, again, showing that he was not your typical dope man. Mm -hmm. For lack of a better word, mm -hmm. he didn't really want to do that. So, but he knows the game. He's got the capital now. After he stings him with this nine hundred thousand dollar lick, so he knows he's from Harlem. He's respected. He's got a reputation. He knows who can move the bag. He's right. looking for work, and then he dealt with the Italians who got the work. Right on. So he became the guy that Lou. I'm a Lou Pee Wee. I'm X Y Z. Hustler and Harlem. Man, if I had a hundred thousand, I could get the right work. I could make some money. Okay, man. Give me, I'm gonna give you this hundred thousand. But in 90 days, 30 days, I need you to give me back 150,000. But you should be able to do that because off of that hundred thousand you invest, you're gonna make about a million. Mm -hmm. So paying me back an extra 50,000 for the finance right. shouldn't be that, no that big. That should be light work. That should be real light work. Mm -hmm. Well, this was kind of Pee Wee's business model. So let's just do some simple calculations because we'll get to no one really knows how much money this man made. Mm -hmm. If you got 10 guys that you're funding their, their bag and you're getting $50,000 a month off of your finance fee, you give them $100,000, they got to pay you back $150,000. Well, 50000 times 10 cats is 500000 all day, every day. Right? Yeah. Now, if you got 20, just do the math. And if you're doing bigger deals, if you're funding people, say, a million dollars, and they got to pay you back a million five, mm -hmm. who knows? Well, some people said they do know. The Financial Times, the Financial Times is a magazine out of England that deals with all the global Wall Street commodity stuff. The Financial Times in the late 60s did a review of Pee Wee Kirkland. Now this ain't, this is, this is oh, the this white folks, Don white folks. <laughs> this ain't what, right, this is all respect, shout out to the big homie Kevin Childs. Uh, and this ain't what Don Diva say. Right. Uh, shout out to the people at Feds and Antoine this, and them. Right, exactly. This ain't what Feds yeah, say. Is. This ain't what none of them say. This is what the white folks who in charge of the white folks say. Nah. The white folks in charge of the white folks at the Financial Times and you got to know how much noise a man like this has to be making for a publication like the Financial Times even to know he exists. Right. I'm making some serious noise. Right, dear. They don't cover hood stories. Right. The Financial Times said the man was worth $33 million in the late 60s. That's $33 million times 10, 10 to 1 ratio again from that money back in the day. That's about $330 million. Right. Most all people who know of Pee Wee and were close to him say that that 33 million is a light count. I believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very much like all of them, and I'm about to say this, and please don't put in the comment, don't compare Eddie Jackson to Pee Wee Kirkland. I'm not trying to compare Eddie Jackson to Pee Wee Kirkland. I'm just comparing two street legends that both I take to be true because they're documented. It was said that Pee Wee had over 100 cars, a mixture of Rolls Royces, Cadillacs, Lamborghinis, Jaguars at one time. And of course, those in Detroit know the legend of Eddie Jackson having 100 Cadillacs on the street at one time. Um, it just makes you really think when I listen at the amount, that golden era, that late 60s, early 70s, um, 
it's unfortunate the amount of money that went through our community and what could have been done with it. But in fairness to all those guys, you know, Pee Wee, they ask him about that and about how much money he really had. He says, you know, when you got that much money, all you know is I got more money than I could ever spend. So why not give it to people who I can help? Why not give it to my friends? Why not give it to my family? Because I bought all the fur coats. I bought all the Rolls Royce. They talk about Pee Wee was 16 driving Corniche Rolls Royces in the 60s. We ain't talking about like what Eddie and Frank 16 Matthew. Years old. He's 16 years old in the 60s. In Cor In Corniche Rolls Royces. Ooh. Dude. Different level kind of shit. It's different level. Yeah. And you were telling me that uh, he had crossed paths with uh, the the infamous Frank Matthews. The infamous Frank Matthews and Frank Lucas. So, right, he has two great stories about, oh, those, wow. about those guys. Okay. Um, first, when they asked him in the interview, um, so please go online. We're not hating. Go online. Um, I, I went down the rabbit hole of really researching this guy. I've read the Fame Fed magazine interview of him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that was a great story. But then I went and it's all kind of stuff on YouTube about about this guy. Right on. Um, so the guy who's interviewing him in this one, I think, is actually the Vice. I'm not sure if it's Vice or Vlad. One of them. Shout out to uh, the homeboy Cavario and the work he's doing over there on Vlad, too. Uh, look forward to him being in town. I think he's going to be in town very soon. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, oh, definitely. We need to catch up. He might be in town now. I need to reach out to him. Anyway, um, he has a story about Frank Lucas and the guy, and he's just, he's keeping it real. He's like, well, you know, Frank Lucas was here and I was way up here. So I didn't really deal with, but someone related to him did cross paths with Frank Lucas and his country boys family organization. Okay. And I'm not throwing shade on him. That's what Frank Lucas's crew was known. I remember as. that. The country, the country boys. boys. The yeah. country boys. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, the friend of Pee Wee Kirkland's, or family member of Pee Wee Kirkland's, got into some financial difficulties, however, because people who are related to rich people still do silly shit. Mm -hmm. Lord knows that we can attest to it. And you always ask yourself, like, why didn't you just come to me for the money instead of doing that dumb shit? But people do that shit. Anyway, somebody close to Pee Wee had got into debt with Frank Lucas's people. Okay. And Frank Lucas's people scoop them up, and they about to, I guess, put hands and feet on them about this tab. Okay. Frank Lucas ends up on the scene and like what's going down here and his people explain to him, man, this nigga owe us money and we about to show him that you can't owe us money. Okay. And the guy who's about to be assaulted say, you know I'm Pee Wee Kirkland's family. And when he says this, Frank Lucas looks at the rest of his crew and is like, hold on, man. Let that man go. Matter of fact, as the legend goes, Frank Lucas goes in his pocket, hands old boy a couple thousand, and tell him, man, you make sure you tell Pee Wee, there ain't no problem. Ain't, ain't we, like didn't, we didn't know that you was, y'all was can. Matter of fact, the hell with what you owe us. Here, you take a couple more thousand, and if you need some more help, cause I don't want no problems. So that's just a, another antidote to kind of the level mm -hmm. of respect that uh, Pee Wee Kirkland had. And then the other one I think that you're referring yeah, yeah. to is about Frank Matthews. Matthews, yeah, yeah, yeah. So as legend goes, Frank Matthews had gave another famous New York hustler, uh, Leroy Nicky Barnes, some work. And, and Nicky owed him about 300000 Mm-hmm. And I guess, you know, niggas do what niggas do. Nicky ain't paid the man his money from. Right. So Frank Matthews don't want this shit to spill all out of control, but he would like to get paid now, those who follow Frank Matthews, this is a guy that has stories, first-hand accounts. He's given friends a million, a million dollars and forgot that he gave it to them kind of shit. Yeah. But he like, in this case, he like, Nicky need to pay me with his money. He owed me. So, I guess he tired of asking Nicky about his money or he ain't the kind of nigga to like asking him. Like, well, I got to ask you about my money. You know you owe me the money. Pay yes, me my money. You know, right. You know who you owe. Mm-hmm. So, he see Pee Wee and he like, Pee Wee, man. Will you talk to your man, Nicky Man, tell him to run me that 300000 that he owed me? And Pee Wee's like, well, it ain't really my business, Frank, but I'll, I'll talk to the nigga for you. So he catch up to Nicky Barnes. And he tell Nicky, he say, man, nah, I didn't, I ran into Pee, I ran into Frank Matthews, man. And he asked me to straighten out this little thing y'all got going with this 300, man. Now, is you going to pay the man? 
And he said, Nikki went told, I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna pay the man. People, 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 no, people, it ain't like that. I'm gonna pay the man. And he's like, uh, well, when you gonna pay the man, Nikki? I'll pay him next week. I'm gonna pay him next week. Tell him I'm gonna pay him next week. The people, ain't gonna be no problems. I'm gonna pay the man. I'm gonna pay the man. And uh, true to his word, next week he paid the man. Man, words were solid, baby. Words were solid, and again, the fact that when a man like Pee Wee Kirkland is acting as the moderator, right, that both very large guys in that world say, you know, if we bring Pee Wee in, everybody know he ain't he ain't the one. If he involves himself in this situation, we should we all got to make this we right. should make this right, <laughs> right? Exactly. Because if it gets made wrong, it could end up real wrong, and that ain't what nobody is trying is trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, of course, parallel to this, the guy is like supposedly one of the greatest basketball players ever to come out of New York, and anyone knows anything about New York? Yeah. It's got a rich basketball history. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Uh, his his feats at the um, Rucker basketball tournament, he's really one of the guys who put the Rucker tournament on the map. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't get a scholarship to a Division One school because he pulled up at the campus during a recruiting trip or something like in a Rolls Royce and the president of the school was like, I'm not giving this young black guy a scholarship and he's driving Rolls Royce. Right. So he ends up going to a Division Three school, which he set all kind of records. Um, he actually was drafted by the Chicago Bulls. They offered him a $40,000 contract. He turns it down because he's saying that would be a pay cut. Getting that work. All right. And it is in, in the interview that I saw, in fact, he says, you know, $40,000 to me at that time was gambling money. That wasn't no money. Now, again, this is coming from a guy who at 16 then already hit a $900,000 lick. Right. So now he's 19, 18, 19, and somebody's offering him $40,000 to play basketball. Which is basically $500,000. Which still, you right. know, I mean, you never know what would happen because people put him, say he was as good as a guy back in the day named Tiny Nate Tiny Archibald, who was regarded as the best point guard in basketball at the time. And mm -hmm. um, Anyway, the fast forward, when Pee Wee ends up catching a case, um, he ends up catching this case like in 19... In the early '71, because yeah, he caught his case even before Frank Matthews' situation in New York or Eddie Jackson's situation, or much later Nicky Bond. So he catches his first case in '71, um, and they send him to Lewisburg. Okay, let me check this. Out. All right, yeah. he's playing in the prison league in Lu in Lewisburg, right? He averages a hundred points a game. Now, you say this ain't pro ball or nothing, but anybody's ever been to jail, you know, there's a lot of talented basketball players in there. Mm -hmm. He's averaging 100 points a game in the, um, in the prison league. Mm hmm Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the fact that no one, um, in fact, there's a Hall of Famer by the name of Connie Hawkins, who's another New Yorker, who played with everyone who played with him, there's like no doubt or dispute that he was not only good enough to go pro, but good enough to have been a great pro. Mm -hmm. um, but a victim of his circumstances. And, and if you listen to the man, um, he, I sh shouldn't even use the word victim because he, he takes full accountability for what he did. Okay. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why he said that there's never been a real project that he's participated on about his life is that they don't want the good, the bad, and the ugly. They want either all the bad or they want all the good. And he's like, there's a lot of crying and suffering and heartache that comes in my story along with all the over-the-top money and the chinchilla coats and the $200,000 Lynx coats and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah.